Hi folks! Welcome to this recap of Geometry and Trigonometry for Math AASL in the IB program. This presentation will be split into two parts. In this first video we'll deal with triangle trig, some geometry, and some trig identities. In the second part we'll deal with trig functions and also trig equations. You can find a link to the second part of the video in the video description. This presentation is not produced or endorsed by the IBO. It's just a review that I made for my students in PEI Canada. It's not exhaustive, but it does go over the key concepts in geometry and trigonometry. There are timestamps and downloadable notes in the video description. You can also make use of YouTube's many accessibility options. One of the best ways to get a lot out of the presentation is to pause and try the questions yourself. There are often many different ways to solve a particular problem, so if you have a different way that's working, please keep doing that. With all that out of the way, let's dive in. Our first topic is about coordinate geometry, in particular midpoint and distance between two points. There are formulas in the formula booklet for midpoint and distance in both two and three dimensions. So let's find the midpoint and distance between these points over here. I'm going to label the first point as x1, y1, z1, and the next one as x2, y2, z2. When you're looking for a midpoint, we're really just looking for the average of the x's and the average of the y's and the average of the z's. So you might initially just say, okay, the average of the x's is 1.5. That's great. If we use the little formula, it's x1 plus x2 all over 2, so that just gives us the average. It's y1 plus y2, so be careful here about the negatives, all over 2. And it's z1 plus z2 all over 2. If we work those out, we're going to get 3 over 2, negative 4, and 7 over 2. And 3 over 2 is just 1.5, so we probably would have been okay intuitively as well. Distance is the change in x squared plus the change in y squared plus the change in z squared, all square rooted. So that really comes out of Pythagorean theorem, or extension of Pythagorean theorem. When I look at my x's, they went from 1 to 2, so the change in x is just 1. If you want to do that as a little formula, change is always final minus initial, so x2 minus x1, or 2 minus 1. All right, the change in x is 1, however we do it. The change in y, the y's went down by 2. And the change in z, the z's went up by 7. In this particular formula, it doesn't really matter about the signs, s-i-g-n, um, because we're going to be squaring all these values. So delta x is 1. Delta y is 2, or negative 2 rather, and delta z is 7. Okay, we square these up, so that would be 1 plus 4 plus 49 is root 54. If we want to, we can write that as the square root of 9 times the square root of 6, or 3 root 6, though that is completely optional. It's lovely like this, as root 54. There are a bunch of formulas in your formula booklet for 3D shapes, so check those formulas if you run into them. They include pyramids, cones, spheres, and rectangular prisms, or a basic box. You may need to consider compound shapes or solids, so ones that are comprised of two different shapes, so maybe something like an ice cream cone, where it's a cone and then a hemisphere sits on top of it. Remember that if the material of one solid is, quote, melted down and reformed into another solid, the volume doesn't change. That brings us to triangles. So in any triangle, all the angles add to 180 degrees, or pi radians, and the larger sides are across from larger angles. In right-angled triangles in particular, we have Pythagorean theorem, and we also have sine, cosine, and tangent definitions. So there's this little mnemonic device, so ka toa that can help you remember them, and it's telling us that sine of some angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that depends on how we label the triangle. If in this triangle I make this my theta, then here's my opposite, here's my hypotenuse, and here's my adjacent side. If I had labeled it differently, and made this the angle I'm interested in, or my theta, then this would be the opposite, or this side across from it. This would be adjacent, and the hypotenuse would not change. So it depends on which acute angle we're talking about. So so tells us a sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. They're ratios of sides in a right triangle. 
So let's put this all together in an example. A square-based pyramid had side lengths of 4 centimeters and a slant height of 6.3 centimeters. We want to find the surface area and volume. And we also want to find the acute angle that each triangular face forms with the base. All right, let's start with just the surface area. So if we think about unfolding one of these pyramids, it kind of looks like this. There are going to be four triangles and one uh, square base. That unfolding is called the net. But I'm just going to write a little formula that helps me remember what's going on here. Surface area is four triangles plus one square base. All right, so that's four. The triangles, I'd have to do half, base times height. And the square base is just side length squared. If I plug in, that'll be four times a half times the base of each of these triangular faces is four. And the height is going to be the 6.3, that is the slant height of the actual pyramid. The base itself is 4 by 4, so it's going to have an area of 16. And I can just plug that into my calculator and get 66.4 centimeters squared. It's centimeters squared because it's an area. Okay, the next thing we're asked for is the volume. And we can go to our formula booklet and it'll say something like this. V is one-third A times H for a pyramid. So A is the area of the base. That's no problem. That is going to be 4 by 4, or 16. The height, though, is a little bit trickier. So I'm going to try and draw this in this pyramid. From, from the top to the bottom, if it went right down to the center of it, I'd get the height. And if I took a cross-section of that pyramid, I'd get a little triangle with a slant height of 6.3 and this height here or this length rather would be half of that 4 so it would be 2 and this height would represent the height of the pyramid so I've got a right angle triangle I know two sides ah, we can find the last side with Pythagorean theorem hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the squares of the other two sides okay. and we can just work that through and we're going to get 5.97, roughly. I'm going to keep a bunch of sig figs here um, because I'm not done of this part of the question. So now that I know that, I can put that in for height, and then we can just put it in our calculator. 1 third times 16 times 5.97 is 31.9, roughly. The last question that we're asked for is the acute angle that it forms with the ground or with the base. So here I can label my triangle. Here's the opposite. Here's the hypotenuse. Here's the adjacent. I could actually use any of the three trig ratios now that I know that this side over here is 5.97-ish. But I think the safest thing to do here would be to use cosine because it relies on values that were basically given to me. So cosine is adjacent, which is 2, over hypotenuse, which is 6.3. That's the ratio of sides. If I want the actual angle, I need to do inverse cosine, or arc cosine, and do that in my calculator. Now, we're talking about triangle stuff here, so often we'll be doing this in degrees. I'm going to make sure that my calculator is in degree mode by pressing mode. Oh, it's not. So I'll set it like this. Press quit, and I'll go inverse cosine of 2 divided by 6.3. And it tells me 71.5 degrees. Now, it didn't specify here whether it had to be degrees or radians, so you could also give the answer in radians. 1.25 radians would be the equivalent. Moving along, we're responsible in Math AA for trig values that are multiples of 30 and 45 degrees. So there are many ways to organize exact trig values. You can use a table, special triangles, a hand trick, unit circle whatever you like. I like to do a unit quarter circle, but do whatever works best for you. And on a unit circle, and when we say unit circle, we mean one that has a radius of 1. So like this would be the point 1, 0. This would be the point 0, 1. On that kind of circle, the x values are just cos theta. So I write in my different angles. This would be 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees and 90 degrees. Okay, I could make a full unit circle, um, but I think it just takes too much time. 
here's pi over 4, here's pi over 3, here they are in radians. So it becomes a little way to convert between radians and degrees as well. And then we have to think about what the actual point values are going to be. And they're all going to be over 2. Zooming in a little bit here. And the way I remember them is through the Jackson 5 tune ABC. Um, but YouTube is famously litigious, so I won't sing anything. But this just goes root 1, root 2, root 3. Okay? And for the y's, same sort of thing. Root 1, root 2, root 3. There we go. That gives us our sine and cosine values for all those angles. You can find the values of tan by going y divided by x. So 0 divided by 1 is 0. 1 divided by 0 is undefined. And I would tend to just write my tangent values on the outside here. So that's what I'm doing here, is writing them in red. Uh, this one would give me 1 over root 3. So the tangent of 30 degrees is 1 over root 3. Anything divided by itself is 1. And this one will give me root 3. A couple of things to note here are that root 2 over 2 is the same as 1 over root 2. So you may run into it either way. Um, and root 3 over 3 is the same as 1 over root 3. Okay, so some people memorize them different ways. But what this table or this unit quarter circle is telling me is that if I want the cosine of 30 degrees, I just go to 30 degrees and pick that x value. If I wanted the sine of 45 degrees, I would go to 45 degrees and pick that y value. And all the other values around the circle are going to be just sort of mirror images of these points. If we're talking about converting between radians and degrees, the big one is that pi radians is 180 degrees. Now, if we move beyond the first quadrant, we might be interested in where each function is positive. So they're all positive in the first quadrant. Sine is positive in the second quadrant, because y is going to be positive there. Tangent is positive in the third quadrant, because negative divided by a negative, or y over x, is positive. And cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant. You might also want to just think of what the points are on the axes, um, because they'll let you know the sine and cosine of multiples of 90 degrees. So one way or another, that information needs to be memorized or understood, and something that you can pull out in a paper 1. Positive angles in standard position are measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. That's why we're moving like this when we talk about the angles. And one nifty little application here is that the slope of a line is equivalent to the tangent of the angle that it forms with the x-axis. So let's take a look at this line right here. It's got an angle of 30 degrees. If I were to build a triangle out of it, and this is our 30 degrees, this we would say is the opposite. This is the adjacent. But there are other words for that as well. We could say that this is the rise, and this is the run. So tan of 30 degrees would be opposite over adjacent. Slope would be rise over run. Those really mean the same thing. So what we get out of this is that the slope of this line is the tangent of 30. And I can find the tangent of 30 right here. I go to 30 and then use the tangent, which I just wrote on the outside. And we've already said that that could also be written as root 3 over 3. Okay, Same number, written two different ways. Now that we've got those values organized, we can start to think about non-right triangles, or oblique triangles. So we have two basic laws for being able to find uh, missing sides or missing angles. One of them is the sine law, and you use it when you know what I would call a pair, a side and its opposite angle. So for example, if I had a triangle like this, in this one I know a side length and the size of the angle opposite it. We can use sine law here, and we will do some examples on them in just a second. When you use sine law to find an angle, remember that you need to consider, at least, both an acute and an obtuse solution. Your GDC is only going to give you one of those two, and that's what we call the ambiguous case of the sine law. Cosine law, we use that to find a third side when we know two sides and the included angle. That means the angle between them. So for example, if I knew this was 17, this is 19, and this is 29 degrees, and I wanted this side, 
There we go, two sides and the angle between them. The other case in which you'll use the cosine law is if you want to find an angle when you know all three sides. The sine law and cosine law are both given in your formula booklet. For cosine law, we've got two forms. Uh, we've got this one here that's great for finding sides, or this one over here for finding angles. They're just rearrangements of the exact same formula, though. Lastly, we have area of a triangle. So we already used area is half base times height in that pyramid question. There's also a way to do it if you don't have the height. We can just go half AB times the sine of C. So C is the included angle between those two sides. Notice that when we're labeling triangles, uppercase letters typically for the angles and lowercase letters for the sides. So let's do a few. Find the exact area of this one over here. So I'm going to think half AB sine C. The two side lengths that I know are 7 and 12. And I need to know the sine of 120 degrees. Now I'm going to think about 120 degrees. If I were to sketch it in standard position, it would look like this. It would have what we call a reference angle of 60 degrees, because this is 120 right here. Well, that's going to have something to do with the 60 degrees that's in the unit quarter circle. I can see in the unit quarter circle that at 60 degrees, I have this point right here. I know that the sine would be the y value. If I'm at 120 degrees, well, it's going to be the same kind of point. The only thing that changes is that the x becomes negative. That's not really that relevant to us, though, because we're looking for the y value. That's the sine. Okay. So however you want to think it through to find the sine of 120 is absolutely OK. We just need to be able to say that it's root 3 over 2. And we can work that through and get 21 root 3 centimeters squared. That brings us to three triangles where we're looking for x. Uh, it's a side in one case. It's an angle in the other two cases. I think it's probably worth pausing the video here and deciding which one's sine law and which ones are cosine law. And we're back. I would say this first one is cosine, because you know all three sides. This one is cosine, because you know two sides and the included angle. And this one over here is sine, because you know a pair. Let's think about the setup. In the first one, we would say cos x is. It's always the ones next to the x. The one you subtract is the one across, over 2 times 6 times 7. I'm going to set up the other two and then come back and solve. So this one's a cosine law. I'll say x squared is all of this. And then the last one, we've got a sine law. I would put what I want as the first thing. So sine x over 21 is equal to the sine of 23 over 12. You can solve these equations however you want. You can solve them graphically if you really wanted to. I do want to mention here that in the end, you're going to have to inverse cosine this one. So a simple way to do this would be to just inverse cosine all of this, and that will give you x directly. I type it in, I hit enter, 44.4 degrees if we're going to do this in degrees. In the next one, in the end, we're going to have to square root. And it's a length, so we don't have to worry about the plus or minus. So maybe when I type it in, I'll have that square root right to begin with. So I've got it all typed in. I've got the square root. I'm in degree mode. I'll just hit enter, and I'll get 7.07 .07 to 3 sig figs. That brings us to the last of these equations. So here, we're probably going to want to isolate sine x. So we'll multiply both sides by 21. So we have 21 sine of 23 degrees all over 12. And I can work that out in my calculator. 21 sine 23 over 12 is about 0.684. I'm going to keep more sig figs because I'm not done with the question yet. And if I want x, I need to do the inverse sine of this. In my calculator, I'll press second sine, and I'll just use the answer that I just got. And it's going to give me 43.1 degrees. But that doesn't really make sense with the diagram. Remember that when we do inverse sine, we need to consider the number we get from our calculator or the obtuse buddy of it, or the complement of it. 
and that would give us 136.9 degrees. Okay, and it does tell us here that x is obtuse, so it's not this one. It's 136.9 degrees, or to 3 sig figs, 137 degrees. That leads us to a quick look at angles of elevation and depression, sometimes just generally called angles of inclination. An angle of elevation is something like this. An angle of depression is the amount you look down by, but they are always measured with respect to the horizontal, or the left to right, across. So here's a question sort of on that idea. From a point 200 meters away from the base of a cliff, there's our cliff up like this, the angle of elevation to the top of the cliff is 17 degrees. Okay, so 17 degrees, let's assume the cliff is a right angle here, and we know we're 200 meters away from the base of that cliff. So this is 200 meters. How tall is the cliff? Let's call it x. This is a situation where you've got a right triangle, you might as well use right angled trig. So this would be opposite, this would be adjacent, here's hypotenuse, we can set it up with tangent and say the tangent of 17 degrees is x over 200, where x is 200 tan 17, and if you work that out, you'll get 61.1 meters. Now you might also say, well, couldn't I just use it with a different rule, with some of those other rules that we just learned? You could, it might not be quite as slick. You could reason out that this angle over here is 73 degrees, that you now know a pair, and so you could use sine law. And this time, since we're looking for a side, I would be inclined to put the side on top and the sine on bottom, and we get 200 sine 17 over the sine of 73 degrees equals x, and that will also give you 61.1. Typically, it's slicker to use uh, some of our right angle trig stuff if we can, but all the rules should be consistent. This brings us to one of the applications of trigonometry, which is bearings. Bearings are measured clockwise from the north, so angles in standard position go counterclockwise from essentially from the east, or positive x. These are going clockwise from the north. And one important property to realize is that if you have something like this, this x angle over here, and you have two parallel lines, this is also the angle x. And the other side of it's going to be 180 minus x. So we have all these sort of z and c principles on the go. We can give them more formal names than that, but let's not. So here's an example. Aerith sets out from home on a bearing of 65 for 3 kilometers. Then she travels 5 kilometers on a bearing of 150. How far is she from home? Well, let's draw it out. So she starts off on a bearing of 65, like this, for 3 kilometers. And this would be 65 degrees. And then she gets to somewhere, and she goes 5 kilometers on a bearing of 150. What you should do is draw in, at the very least, a little north-south line, or maybe even the axes right here, because this is going to tell us her next bearing is 150 degrees from north. So it's going to go something like this, and she's going for 5 kilometers this time. We could make a little final side here, because this is going to be the distance we want to know. How far is she from home? And in order to work this out, we're going to have to figure out some angles. This little angle here is going to be 65 degrees because it is the same as this one. This little angle in here is going to be 30 degrees because 150 and 30 add up to 180. Now that I know all this information, I'm going to redraw this triangle without all of this uh, extra axis stuff and all these extra angles in it. So essentially, I have a triangle with 3 kilometers and 5 kilometers, and then this angle right here would be that 65 plus the 30, or 95 degrees. I am looking for this side over here. Let's call it x. So this is a cosine law situation, because we know two sides and the included angle. If we work that all out, we should get 6.051. If you got 36, then you still need to square root. And now let's look at the rest of the question. 
How far is she from home? Not much we know. There's part A. Part B, if we send a drone from her home straight to her to deliver a pizza, on what bearing should it travel? In other words, what is this bearing over here? Well, in order to find that out, we're going to want to know what this angle right here is. Now, we're at a point here where you could use sine law or cosine law. Cosine law has some advantages because it's got no ambiguity. Sine law is probably a little faster here. It's up to you. What I know is, I know this is 6.051. I know a pair, so I could use sine law here. Sine theta over 5 is equal to sine of 95 degrees over 6.051. And this is not going to get me the bearing directly. So sine theta is going to be equal to 5 sine 95 degrees all over 6.051. I can work that out in my calculator. It gives me a ratio, and I need to do inverse sine of that ratio because I actually want the angle. So it gives me 55.4. Now we could also say, or it might be 180 minus 55.4, uh, which would be 126.6. Is there any chance that in this triangle, that purple angle is 126.6? No way. That would put us over 180 degrees for the triangle. So that's how we know that this is not an ambiguous case. We know it's the acute angle. So we'll get rid of all this, and we'll go back to the original drawing. We know we've got 65 degrees, and we've got another 55.4 degrees. Bearing that we need to travel on is just 65 plus that 55.4. So let's write it out. 65 degrees plus 55.4 degrees would be 120.4 degrees, or to three sig figs, just 120. That brings us to sector area and arc length. So an arc is like the crust of a pie. We would call this a minor arc because it is less than half of the circle. And if we were to look at the other arc that we get out of this situation, we could call that a major arc. Sector area is the slice area, or how much pizza you get. And there are formulas for each of them. These are given in radian measure. And they're really just proportions of the circumference or of the area of the full circle. So if we look at the example below, we've got a circle with a radius of 10 centimeters. One thing to notice is, if it has a radius of 10 centimeters, then this is 10, but also this is 10. And we're asked for a few things. The area of triangle AOB. So the area of a triangle we already saw is half AB sine C. For us, that's half times 10 times 10 times the sine of 1.7. So we just work that through in the calculator. Now, are we in radians or degrees here? We are in radians, not because of a pi, but because there are no degree signs. So 1.7 without a degree sign is 1.7 radians. That means if I'm going to use some trig functions, like sine, cosine, or tangent, my calculator has to be in radian mode. And I put it in radian mode, and I got 49.6 for this. So that's 49.6 centimeters squared. Part B says, find the area of the sector. And that is just half r squared, so half times 10 squared, times 1.7, which will work out to be 85 centimeters squared. Find this area of the shaded segment, that's what this is called. Well, that would just be the sector area. The sector area would have been all of this. And the triangle area would have been this blue stuff here. So it would be yellow minus blue, or 85 minus 49.6 centimeters squared. That would give us 35.4 centimeters squared. Lastly, it says find the length of the major arc AB. So that would be this arc. And since the angle that's inside was 1.7, 
the angle out here is going to be 360 degrees minus that, or in radians, that would be 2 pi minus 1.7. And then we just use this arc length formula. So L would be radius, which is 10, times that big angle, which is 2 pi minus 1.7. You can give that exactly as 20 pi minus 17, or you can give it as a decimal approximation as 45.1 centimeters. The last topic that we'll deal with in this video is trig identities. Trig identities allow us to express equivalent quantities or functions in different ways. They can be manipulated, they can be rearranged, and the key ones that we see in the formula booklet for SL are the tan is sine over cosine. We kind of knew that from the unit circle anyways. Tangent was y over x. And that's sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, which also kind of comes from the unit circle. There are also double angle formulas that tell us the sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta, cos theta. And cos of 2 theta has three equivalent forms, and they just come from using that Pythagorean identity, the sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, in different ways to rearrange it. If you see a sine x or a cos 2x, it's pretty fishy. There's a good chance that you're going to need to use these formulas. So make sure that you know where they are in the formula booklet. There are many ways of accomplishing the question that I'm about to do, um, but I'm going to do it just with the identities rather than pictorially. So here we know that sine x is 4 fifths, and that x is an angle between pi over 2 and pi. And we're looking for cos x. So I want to use a formula that has sine x in it, the thing I know, and cos x in it, the thing I want, and nothing else, ideally. And this is the closest thing to that. It's the Pythagorean identity, so I can just write it here. Sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1. And that means that the sine of x, all squared, plus the cosine of x, all squared, equals 1. Now, we know that the sine of x is 4 fifths, so we can sub it in, and that's great. We're down to just one variable, the thing we're looking for, cos x. And I can square this, and that gives me 16 twenty fifths. I'm going to rewrite 1 as 25 twenty fifths, because I'm going to move that 16 twenty fifths over. So I'll subtract it from both sides. And that'll give me that the cos of x all squared is 9 over 25. And then I square root. And when we square root both sides in an equation, we have to consider the positive or the negative. Okay, so it looks like there are two possibilities. But now we can use this fact. We know that this angle is in the second quadrant. And in that quadrant, cosine is negative. The x's are negative. So cosine is negative 3 fifths. Or cosine of x is negative 3 fifths. Now we're asked to find some other values. Cos of 2x. And we want these values exactly, and we want to do them without our GDC. Well, there are a pile of equivalent terms that mean cos of 2x. We could do cos squared minus sine squared. We could do 2 cos squared minus 1 or 1 minus 2 sine squared. The safest one to do here, though, is this, because it only relies on values that we were given to begin with. They told us sine x is 4 fifths. We assume we're right in part a, and they should give us follow-through marks either way, uh, but it would be probably be a good idea to be as correct as possible. So that means we've got negative uh, 1 minus 2 times 4 fifths all squared. It's very sad when people do the 1 minus 2 first. So that's 1 minus 2 times 16 over 25, or 1 minus 32 over 25. Uh, 1 is just 25 over 25. So cos 2x is negative 7 over 25. And we just follow the algebra. Similarly, if we wanted sine of 2x, well, there's a little identity for that, 2 sine x cos x. Now, here we do have to use the value we found. Uh, so sine x is 4 fifths. Cos x we found was negative 3 fifths. Multiply it all through, we get negative 24 over 25. The last thing it asks us for is the tangent of 2x. And there actually is a tangent double angle identity. 
Now, but the simplest way to find this is just to say it's sine 2x. We've got it right up here, tan theta sine over cosine. So tan of 2x is going to be sine 2x over cos 2x. Okay, and I sub that in. Sine 2x is negative 24 over 25. Cos 2x is negative 7 over 25. And when we divide fractions, we multiply by the reciprocal. So that would be 25 over 7. Ah, a negative negative makes a positive. So I get a final answer of 24 over 7. We found some answers to little logic puzzles around trigonometry. That brings us to the end of this video. In the next one, we'll be looking at trig functions and trig equations. I hope that you found this helpful. Good luck with the material, and take care, folks.